Hello? Hello? Testing, testing. Can you hear me? If so, your ears are working, or they are not fully functional, but they're being assisted by some kind of electronic device, or you're an alien. Either way, let's learn about the parts of the human ear. Sorry, aliens. Okay, here's where we'll start. I'm going to ask you to take your hand and put it on your ear. Just like that. Are you doing it? No? Why not? You afraid you look stupid? Don't worry about it. Everyone's stupid. Do it. Okay, now that you're doing it, uh, what you're actually holding right now, most people refer to as their ear, but in actuality, your ear is an extremely complex organs with many sub-organs, let's call them, things that have different jobs other than hearing. Now, hearing, of course, is the primary function of the ear, but there are other interesting functions that we're about to learn about. But what you're holding, although you usually call it your ear, is actually called the pinna. So you can let go of your ear now, or your pinna, rather. The pinna is a cool little funnel that basically takes all of the incoming sound that comes from your environment, or maybe a video that you're watching on a screen right now, and it takes those sound waves being emitted by that source, and it funnels them down into the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is the ear canal, something you're probably already a bit familiar with. Uh, so the ear canal is just a tube through which sound can travel, and ideally, if there's not all that much earwax and gunk in there, then the sound will travel pretty efficiently, and you'll end up hearing the sound. But of course, you don't just hear the sound if the sound reaches the next part of the journey, which is the eardrum, because the eardrum is one of just many interesting pieces we're about to learn about that are inside your head to allow you to hear. So the pinna funnels the sound into your ear, the ear canal carries it through the ear towards the eardrum, and the eardrum is actually pretty aptly named because it is literally a drum. Now, you've probably seen a drum in action before, if you were ever in band, or if you're in a rock band, or if you've ever just hit a drum before, you know what it does. It makes a sound when you smack it. Now, why does it do that? Well, it's because it's a very tough and tightly pulled membrane that's wrapped very tightly around some kind of cylinder that makes it very taut, so that when something smacks it, it vibrates up and down very, very quickly and with a lot of power. So that creates the vibration, which knocks into air molecules, which is the sound wave that reaches your ears. That's how a drum works. Now, those used to be made out of animal skins. Now they're made mostly from plastic. Um, so actually, the fact that your eardrum is a flap of skin moving back and forth actually makes it very similar to drums, which were actually in the past made out of animal skin. Kind of cool. Kind of gross, too. But anyways, yeah, your eardrum is just a flap of skin, and it goes back and forth. Now, why does it go back and forth? Well, that's because of the sound waves that came in through the ear canal that were smacking into it. So now your eardrum at this point is vibrating back and forth, and what that knocks into is pretty interesting. These are actually the three smallest bones in your body, and believe it or not, there are bones in your ear. It's a group or a cluster of bones called the ossicles. Now, the ossicles, again, are kind of a three-part team, so I'll talk about each of them individually, but they do sort of act as a group, almost like a chain reaction. What happens first is the eardrum sends its vibrations into what's known as the malleus, which is the most prominent and the first ossicle that's inside your ear. Now, the malleus is occasionally called the hammer because of its job, which is basically to smack into the next bone, which is the incus. So the incus is basically just something that receives the vibration from the malleus. So the malleus, or the hammer, smacks into the incus, and the incus is typically referred to as the anvil. Uh, so why is it called an anvil? Well, it's typically because hammers were used to smack into anvils to create things like swords and axes and other cool things that you'd see in Game of Thrones. So there's the first two. Now the incus is going to do the same thing to the stapes, which is the last of these ossicles. Uh, same thing that the malleus did to the incus. The incus is going to smack into the stapes, and the stapes will receive that vibration, and they'll carry it on to the next few organs. Now the stapes are typically called the stirrup because they sort of visually appear to look like the stirrups that a person would put their foot into when they're riding a horse. So the stapes will now transfer their energy into the next few organs. Now, the thing that's in that region of the head that looks kind of like a snail almost, that funky looking thing, that's very interesting. That is called the cochlea, which is the most fun organ of the ear to talk about because it just sounds so fun when you say it. Try it. Cochlea. Cochlea. Isn't it fun? Okay, so the cochlea is this weird snail looking thing in your ear. It actually has a very important purpose. The cochlea 
cochlea is basically this cavern that's full of this jelly-like liquid. And inside of the liquid are tiny little hairs called stereocilia. Go ahead and say it with me. Stereocilia. Stereocilia. Great job. The stereocilia are hairs, little tiny hairs, that convert sound energy into electrical energy. That may seem like a pretty impressive feat, but that's actually happening in your body 24-7. Sound is being turned into electricity. Now, why does that happen? Well, it's because the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is the auditory nerve, a nerve being something that carries information electronically, an auditory meaning sound, the auditory nerve carries the electrical signal from the stereocilia to the brain. Why does the brain get electricity sent to it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's because the brain operates on electricity, which makes you technically a robot. Cool. Now, fun fact, why are the stereocilia called stereocilia? Because cilia means tiny hair and stereo means sound, in a way. Sort of. Now, fun fact, your stereocilia are actually quite sensitive to sound energy. In fact, if there are energy waves that are sent into your ear that are too loud, aka their amplitude is too great or they have too much power, then what can happen is those loud energy noises can actually destroy the stereocilia. I know, very tragic. What can happen when those stereocilia are destroyed is you can lose part of your hearing. So when people are older and they're like, huh? or what? all the time, that's very likely because of their amount of exposure to sound throughout their life. So those elderly folk went to too many Grateful Dead concerts, and as a result of the loud noises, they lost part of their hearing. And maybe it was other stuff too. Uh, but the loudness of the music that you listen to has quite an impact on your ability to hear when you're older. So it's actually recommended by doctors that when you're listening to music on your phone or something like that, and you've got headphones in, your volume should ideally be turned to about halfway to full volume. That's a safe level to listen to your music. Any louder than that, and you're likely over time to develop some version of hearing loss. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now we've taken the whole journey through our ear to create sound that turns into electricity, which the brain can now interpret, and we've basically got the whole hearing thing down. But there's still two little organelles I haven't mentioned yet. So what are these other two things that we're going to highlight? Well, these are really cool because although they are a part of your ear, they have nothing at all to do with sound. So what's the first one? Well, up on top, we have these little tubes, these little hoops on top of the uh, cochlea, which are called the semicircular canals. Now, why are they called semicircular canals? Well, duh, Mr. Cowell, they're canals and they're half circles. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You got it. Nice job. The semicircular canals do something totally different from listening. They're actually full of water. Not exactly water, but sort of like a watery liquid, sort of like the cochlea is. It's a canal and it's full of liquid. It acts almost like a spirit level, which you may not know by name, but it's that thing that you balance things on. So when you're trying to see if a picture frame is level on a wall, you might hang a spirit level on top of it and see where the bubble goes. And if that bubble is in the middle, that means that the water is balanced due to gravity. And so you can tell from the spirit level if something is you know, flat or not. The semicircular canals actually act like a spirit level in the sense that there is water inside of them, but there are also parts where there is not water. And based on the location of that air pocket or the region where there is no liquid inside the canal, that actually tells your brain what your physical orientation is. So if your head is twisted to the side, then that air pocket is going to be located in a different location in the semicircular canal. So your brain will say, aha, my head is twisted because of the location of the air pocket. So that's actually how you balance your body is from these little tiny canals in your brain. And you might notice from this picture that there are actually three different canals for the three different dimensions of our universe. So there's the X, the Y, and the Z dimension. For those of you in advanced math classes, whoa, the Z dimension, what's he talking about? Oh, you'll get there, trust me. Okay, so the final organelle that we can talk about is called the Eustachian tube. Now, the Eustachian tube is something that you probably have never even known exists before, just like a few of these other things. Uh, but this one might kind of skeeve you out a little bit because this is basically just a hole inside of your face. Now, you may already know this, but your nose, your mouth, and your ears are all connected through a series of tubes and chambers in the inside of your head. So there is a hole inside of your head that your ears, your nose, and your mouth are all connected to. And the Eustachian tube is part of this system of tubes. 
just like the internet, it's a series of tubes. So the Eustachian tube is connected to this middle ear portion. And I haven't really highlighted this yet, but on the bottom you can see there's a section called outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The outer ear is everything that you're pretty much familiar with from everyday experiences with ears and that kind of stuff. The middle ear is where the ossicles live, and the inner ear is all the stuff that's connected directly to your brain. So that's the really sensitive stuff you don't want getting messed up. Now in the middle ear, there are the ossicles, which we've already discussed, but there's also um, a chamber of air inside of there, and the ossicles are sitting in that chamber of air. And usually your eustachian tube, which is a tube that leads from the middle ear down to your throat, usually that tube is shut. That's its default position, is being closed and sealed up. Now, what usually happens is that humans live most of their life on the same altitude, or at least that's been the case for you know the thousands of years that we've existed on planet Earth. We pretty much stay either on the mountain we lived on or in the valley we lived on. But now humans have developed technology like airplanes that allow us to climb to high altitudes and then descend to low altitudes very rapidly. And when you do this, if you've been on a plane before, you've probably noticed that your ears pop as you go really, really high up, and your ears pop again as you go really, really low down. So why does this happen? Well, it's actually because of the eustachian tube. So here's why your ears pop. When you're on the ground, there's a certain amount of air that is inside of your middle ear, and that air is trapped in there. Now, it's pretty much going to be balanced with the air that's on the other side of the eardrum, so that means your eardrum is happy because the air pressure on one side equals the air pressure on the other. That means your eardrum can oscillate back and forth without shredding itself in half or blowing out in one direction. So that's pretty happy eardrum right there. But when you climb high, high, high up in a plane, then what's happening is the air outside of your ear becomes lower and lower pressure because there's less air high up in the atmosphere. Even inside the chamber of plane, the air pressure does decrease a little bit. So the air that's trapped inside your middle ear is still the same air pressure as it's always been because it's locked inside your head. The eustachian tube is closed, so that air is sealed in there. But the air that's outside your ear is low pressure. So high pressure inside, low pressure outside. The pressure difference makes your eardrum unhappy and it's not able to oscillate the way that it wants to. So what will happen is when there's enough of a pressure difference between inside your head and outside your head, the eustachian tube will open up and air will rush out of your ear, out through your throat, into the environment. So what happens when your ears pop is your ears are creating equilibrium in air pressure from the inside of your ear to the outside of your ear. And where does that air go when your ears pop? It comes out your throat and either out your nose or if your mouth is open because you're chewing gum or something, it comes out your mouth. Now I mentioned gum and that's something that people ask about quite a bit. They ask Mr. Cowell, why is it that when you chew gum, your ears don't pop as much? And that happens because when you chew gum, yeah, actually I'm gonna have you kind of participate in this and feel this for yourself. If you take two fingers and you put it below your ear at your jaw connector, right around here, and you pretend like you're chewing gum, go ahead and go like this. Kind of move your jaw around, almost like you're chewing gum. Like think a really obnoxious person chewing gum. Like a cow chewing its cud. And when you do that, you can feel, and I really hope someone is watching you from afar do this right now, you can feel your jaw moving around, and that's actually where the eustachian tube is. So as you move your jaw around really aggressively when you're chewing gum, your eustachian tube is likely to dislodge and open a little bit every time you chew. So chewing gum, especially, which your jaw really has to work hard at, can even out and can break out some of the air that was high pressure inside of your middle ear. So what's actually happening every time you chew gum and your ears don't pop is your ear is able to create an equilibrium where the pressure inside your middle ear is the same as the pressure in your outer ear. Now your ears might still pop even if you're chewing gum, but it's likely to be less of a all at once very intense pop. It's likely to be just little tiny bits of pressure here and there. So that's about all you need to know about the ear for our purposes today. Uh, hopefully you were listening and your cochlea was intact and you haven't been killing your stereocilia today with loud music. Uh, as you turn off this device and you walk to your next class, I hope your semicircular canals will prevent you from falling over. And uh, yeah, that'll do it for us today. Thanks.